How's everyone going today? It's my standard question. Are you going to give me your standard answer as well? <laughs> anyway, today's subject is going to be a very interesting subject. So what I'll do is I'll write the topic of it down. So it's part of the Human Soul series of talks that I've been doing. And perhaps before I mention today's topic, tomorrow's topic, for those who want to come along, <laughs> is actually about your relationship with God and developing a passion for God. So that'll be tomorrow's topic, developing a passion for God. The, today's topic is emotions. And the mother taboo. So, um, <laughs> um, the first thing I would like to talk about with you about this subject is this. Many of you ladies in particular are going to feel that I'm being unfair with you. And many of you are going to feel a bit angry about that perhaps if you're not already angry <laughs> about it already. <laughs> and um, this, this issue actually, I've, I've dealt with a lot of my mother emotions. In fact, I've hardly got any women-based emotions left at all aside from my soulmate-based emotions now. And so I am in a very, very clear space when it comes to women. All right? Now, many of you women have already experienced that with me. You know that I'm loving with you, with the way in which I deal with all of your emotional injuries. You know that I, I don't get angry with you and upset with you, even though sometimes you're quite angry and upset with me. And, uh, and so you know that I'm in a fairly clear space when it comes to women and how women feel about things. You also know and realise that uh, for many centuries, uh, if we can say the last 20 of them, um, I've always promoted women's equality with men in all of my actions. And because of that, um, a lot of uh, men have been very, very confronted by what I've done with them in terms of helping men get into a stage where they recognise the equality of women. Now, in the first century, what, it, what would happen quite, quite often was the men would be in more of a rage with me than the women. And the reason why is that many of the men felt that I was treating women too equal. Right? And they had this very, very strong opinion uh, that they were ma the masters of the human race, basically, and that the women were their possessions. And they treated women like their possession as well. And then you have a man come along who never treated a woman like a possession at all. You imagine the confrontation and many of the confrontations actually that my own disciples had with me in the first century were about women. So many of the men were very angry with me uh, very frequently as a result of my treating women well. They were also very angry with me in my relationship with Mary in the sense that every time I demonstrated or, or was involved with any discussion with any group of people, I would always have Mary with me. And that meant that there was often a group of men, sometimes 10, 20 men, and Mary was the only woman present because none of the other men would actually invite their women to come along. Which meant, of course, that these men would often be angry with me um, as a result of my saying the woman was just, had as, just as much right to be here and to have, uh, and have a part in this conversation as a, as a male does. The result of that was after I passed, there was a lot of uh, backlash against Mary from the male disciples. And as a result of that, uh, Mary got treated quite poorly by many of the men who, were my, who believed themselves to be my friends at the time. So many of the people you know of, like Peter and James and so forth, um, who you would have heard of in the Bible, they were our personal friends. And many of them, after my passing, treated Mary quite badly as a result of my saying that Mary was equal to me. 
Now, that all being the case, now it's the same. I still have the same feeling towards men and women in that they are equal to each other in all aspects. And you know from my own dealings with you, particularly those of you who are women, you know that from my dealings with you that I uh, have treated you with the utmost of respect and love and care and I've always listened to your issues and, and problems and I've always uh, also tried to address the underlying causal emotions with love in you. You also notice from my relationship with Mary that um, I treat Mary with that same respect as what I treat you. Now I'm just reminding you of that. And the reason why I'm reminding <laughs> you of that is because after this session you're going to think that I've been very unfair towards women. All right? And I want to remind you up front of the underlying emotions that, uh, that I have towards women so that you can cast your mind back and ask yourself, well, how does AJ treat me when I have a personal interaction with him? Because that, if, you, if you can remember that, then you won't get hooked into the anger you feel after the result of this conversation. Does that make sense? Now, you'll notice today there are more men here again today, right? So we'd just like to welcome those men who haven't been here before. And, and the reason why there are more men here today is because myself and Mary are working our way through these emotions about the woman-man issue. And this subject will hopefully go a long way to evening out our uh, audiences to be 50-50 male and female. All right? One of the reasons why we have not had 50-50 male-female audience is because many of you ladies are holding on to your rage with men. And as a result of that, of course your men do not want to come along with you while you're in that space. And we want to talk about how we can work our way through these emotions. Now one of the other things I want to do too is just address um, the reasons why I want to have this discussion with you. What we've noticed in the workshops and the presentations that actually it's the women who have projected the most rage right, in all of the workshops and in all of these presentations that we've ever done. In fact, I've only ever had one male, even though I've talked on many numerous occasions, and in fact far more occasions about the male emotions in terms of negatively than the females, even though I've done that, uh, even though I've done this talking about the male's uh, stuff and talking about freely about th that the male needs to deal with these particular emotions, I've only ever had one male come up and complain to me that I was being unfair to men. Right? And in almost every session I've ever presented, I've had a female, usually more than one, come up to me and complain about the emotions about females that are being presented. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells me the same is going on with the workshops as well, and that is that many women are very resistive to looking at themselves emotionally about what's going on. Now, what we're also noticing is that there is a large number of spirits coming along to the workshops that Mary's presenting who are very negative, angry women spirits who are shutting down the workshops in such a manner that whenever we try to get the people in the workshop into their mum emotions, these women spirits become enraged. And what we often find is when we're doing the male-based emotions, the father-based emotions, everyone connects to them fine. And everyone gets into their rage and gets into their anger and then gets into their grief and releases their stuff and starts releasing stuff towards the, towards the male but uh, often in an angry place still, but they, there's, they get into their stuff towards dad quite well. But when it comes to their mum stuff, the majority of people feel they don't have any of it with their mum. And what I'm going to tell you today is actually the majority of your emotions came from your mum. And that's particularly the case in the Western society. And we'll talk about the reasons why emotionally. 
So what I want to do is present to you today what's going on between the masculine and the feminine, but particularly what's happening for many women. And, and one of the things I felt today was a heavy, heavy pro projection upon the audience to not be here today. And I know many of you made a last minute choice to be here today. And the reason why is we prayed about it, myself and Mary, quite a lot, that, that our celestial friends would help you get over the resistance to coming and be present in a discussion about the mother taboo um, because it's such an important issue. So does anyone have any questions at this point as to what I'm going to discuss? No? All right. Well, let's talk about why I want to discuss this issue. Um, firstly, we we'll talk about why mother emotions, if I could do it in quotations, are dominant. Uh, I'm trying to say things, uh, do things faster than I'm... are dominant. And this is particularly the case in Western society, but it does pertain to almost all societies on the planet at the moment. From the age of when you were born to the age in Western society, generally it's four or five years of age, who do you spend most of your time with? It's your mother. If you think about it, the average nuclear family, if we can call them that, um, in other words, dad, mum and children. And because we're quite uh, res removed from the you know, grandparents or you know, the great-grandparent type uh, relationship that many have in other societies, in, in a Western society, often it's the parents who have the primary caregiving role towards the children or some kind of um, age, ch sorry, child care arrangements have some kind of dominance there as well. Now let's look at, from a percentage point of view, how much time gets spent with the males compared with the females as you're growing up. So what happens to Dad? What's his general life? Well, he, he might get up at 6 or 7 in the morning. He'd usually be off to work at, say, 8 a.m., let's say. And the kids are up at the same time, but they're getting ready for school. But let's say he might get one hour of time with them in interactions. It won't, they won't be very quality interactions because everyone's busy, getting washed, getting dressed and all those kind of things. But let's see how, say he gets about one hour there. From then, from 8am to let's say 5, but, but it, generally nowadays there's a lot of travelling involved and everything else. So you could say from 8am to 6pm for the average family, the male is not present. But who is? Mum is. So mum gets that hour in the morning and then she also gets 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is how many hours? 10 hours that dad doesn't get with the child. And then dad and mum come, everyone's home, dad comes home, and from 6, the average child by, by the time 7.30, 8 o'clock comes along, they're usually in the sack, aren't they? They're usually in bed. So he might get, let's say, two hours maximum with them there. Right? But he comes home tired and he's... A bit grumpy from doing a job that he never liked in the first place. And on top of that, he's obviously, you know, there's work to be done in the sense of, you know, preparation for meals and all these different things to be done. You know, there might be even things like outside things that got to be done, the lawn mode or whatever else one needs to be done. Take the kids to nowadays, you know, the, the footy and the, you know, the basketball and the music lessons and the ballet and, <laughs> and everything. And before you know it, there's very little of that time. But let's say it's two hours that he gets with the child, which of course mum also gets. So mum's getting 13 hours with the child and dad's getting three hours total in a day. So straight away, what does that tell you? Who has the most emotional influence environmentally over the child? Mum, obviously. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be that way, does it? It doesn't have to be that way, does it? But the fact that it is that way is all about what? 
It's all about the fact that we already have a dynamic on this planet where we've accepted that the woman's role is a certain thing, right? And this comes from generations, does it not? That the woman's role, have, the women have the role of bringing up the children until a certain age and then other people take it over generally. Now let's say mum does work. Let's say she does go to work. Um, so by the time the child hits maybe even one year age nowadays or even younger, often the child gets childcare, doesn't it? How many male childcare uh, helpers have you ever seen? It's very rare, isn't it? Uh, I personally have not met one, but I do know of some that do have male childcare helpers. But generally, what, what is the dominant influence at childcare? Again, it is female, feminine. So the same thing applies again, doesn't it, really? And this time the mum's not getting the 10 hours in between, but another woman is. So it's still a female influence in that period of time. Does that make sense? Okay. Then you start school. So you're five, four or five years of age, you go to prep first or whatever it is, that, or in different countries, whatever you want to call it. And then you go to, you know, you're five years of age in, in grade one here in Australia. In other countries it's a little different, but... Um, and then grade two, who, what are the dominant gender of teachers at that age group? Females, are they not? So you'll get a school where there's only two male teachers or three male teachers in primary school and the rest are females. And it's rare to even get more than half, it's even, rare to get an even number of males and females in a primary school teaching environment. Does that make sense? So we still have the same dominance. So this is up to, say, five years of age. And then from five through to even in Australia to 12, it could be still quite a lot of female dominance in terms of the time that's getting spent with this child. So we know now from our own experience and also from what we've been taught about all of the emotions that enter us as people, we know that actually the dominant emotions Come, that enter us, that are damaging us to our damaging to our soul, come from our environment. And if our environment is dominantly female all the way through our formative years, can you see that obviously the group of emotions that we need to deal with are going to be dominantly coming from the female side of our of the gender uh, injuries. Now, that being said, the female. Let's look at the average person, the average woman, who is now a mother. So here's mum. She has a group of emotions in her. And the group of emotions in her, some of which are reflected towards her father or lack of a father in her life, and some of which are reflected towards her mother. Does that make sense? But... 80% of the emotions that she have, has came from her mother. So even though she might have huge amounts of rage with the male, 80% of that rage came from her mother and not the interaction with her father. Does that make sense? In other words, 80% of that rage come from her mother's rage with the male. Because if you look at the percentage of time, We've, the male's only had three hours with her, whereas right, the, the female's had 13 hours with, with the person in, a, in the day in her formative <coughs> years. So, and this is something many of these spirits that are with us need to recognise too, who have been here projecting at you not to go into your mother emotions. They need to realise actually that most of your emotions came from your mother's emotions and most of her emotions came from her mother's emotions. Does that make sense? and so forth. And what we need to do is start recognising that actually dealing with the mother emotions is going to be one of our greatest challenges. It's going to be one of the most difficult things we do. And so what we normally do when we're processing emotions, the natural thing of the soul, is to do what's easy first. So what we finish up finding is we start getting into our male-based emotions. In other words, the emotions we have towards the male. Bearing in mind, of course, that 80% of those actually came from our mother. So 80% of my own emotions towards the male, towards myself and towards the male, actually come from my, what my mother taught me about the male. Does that make sense to you? 
And, and so therefore, even what I feel is about my dad is really about my mum's issues with her dad. Does that make sense? It's not really about my dad even, it's about my mum's issues towards her dad. And that she is not here, 80% of it at least is that. All right, and what about my issues about mothers? Well, that's going to be very much about my mum's viewpoint of herself and my identity with that. And so what, what happens a lot of the times is 80% of my emotions towards the women come from the woman herself as well. And 20% comes from the male about the woman. And this is whether we're male or female as the child, it doesn't really matter. So here's our mum and her influences, if we draw her influences, I'll draw her down a little further. Here's mum, her influences are 80% comes from her mum's emotions, of which you'd say a good half are going to be about dad and a good half are going to be about herself, right? And then 20% of the emotions come from her dad, a good half of which will be about himself and some of it will be about women. And that enters mum. And mum's now got all these emotions and she gives, she, she gets, conceives you and right from the moment of conception, any of those emotions that are unhealed are entering you. Right? So they're entering you from that moment. It's no wonder you wake up after a birth crying, isn't it? Like because you've, you've already got nine months of crying to do before you began. Right? <laughs> That's how it is. So here we are, we're this, this little child. Of course we could be a male child or we could be a female child, but either way we're going to have these very big influences coming from our mother because mum is spending 80% 80 80 of mum's time is actually, uh, of our time with a parent, is about our time with mum. So can you see straight away why we've already got a lot of emotions to do with about mum? And they're not necessarily ab about mum. They're often about what mum believes. Does that make sense? So if mum believes that, for example, the Catholic religion is the only religion for her and any other religion is not acceptable, then there's a higher likelihood, if mum believes it, that I will actually take on that belief than it is if dad believes it. Can you see that? And if mum believes that it's acceptable to actually sit in a, in a relationship that's, a, a, that's damaging to herself, right, for the sake of the children, what am I going to grow up and believe? Well, there's an 80% probably chance that I'm going to grow up believing the same thing, that it's acceptable to live in a violent uh, relationship for the sake of the children. It's a pretty high likelihood I'll have the same belief. And so, can you see how the mum's emotions have a huge effect on me as an individual? Like I have a huge amount of emotions in me that are about what my mother accepts as true. And can you see that it's actually easier for me to disagree with my father's beliefs than it is to disagree with my mother's beliefs? Well, you think about it. If he's only got three hours with me, I'm only going to be at loggerheads with him for three hours. <laughs> if, how hard is it to be at loggerheads with someone for 13 hours? It's a very much more difficult, isn't it, to, to do that? And so what we finish up doing is we finish up Try, trying our best, even with the emotions that we don't agree with, to accept or somehow cope with my mother's belief systems and we will be pandering to my mother's belief systems far more than I would to my father's belief systems. Because my father only has three hours that he can disagree with me, whereas my mother has 13. So there are a lot of very practical reasons why our issues with our mothers are some of the biggest issues we're ever going to face. Right? But now what I would like to discuss is a whole other set of dynamics that are going on with our mothers that don't generally happen with our fathers, that make these emotions even more difficult to access and deal with. So not only now do we have 80% of our emotional belief systems, 80% of our intellectual belief systems, 
80% of our emotional damage will mirror my mother's emotional damage and belief systems, right? Not only do I have that happening, but now I have another dynamic getting created by my mother herself. What do most mothers believe about themselves? I'm a great mum. Yeah. Well, uh, underneath that is I'm not a great mum, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> most of the time, right? But what do they tell you? Oh, mum knows best. You never hear a father knows best, do you? It's rarely, anyway. <laughs> I, I, own, I created you, you've got to do what I say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's keep going. Do what I say. I know better than you, I'm your mother. How many of you heard that from your mother? <laughs> Uh, or, or just the thing is, I'm your mother. And, and that can be applied to a thousand situations, can it not? Like, so you've got to do what I say because I'm your mother. Like, you know, it's always I'm your mother is brought up. You, very rarely here, but I'm your father and you've got to do that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Peter, would you like to just grab the mic up, please? Just, if, just leave your hand open. My mother used to say to me, if you don't behave, I know better, but I'll call on your father. Exactly. See, now we're the, starting the threat, to get... The threat of, of violence. The threat <laughs> of father's violence. My, my wife, when, I, when my boys were young, used to say to my boys, you wait till your dad gets home. Now, how many of you have had that said to you? Okay, the majority of you, right? So you wait till your dad gets home. Now, that is a very subversive thing your mother is actually doing. Because what she is doing is she is controlling the violence towards your person through that action. She is actually also in control of your father. right? And she is able to manipulate him in such a way that he is willing to belt you at her word. And that is a very aversive and underhanded thing to actually create. Because what it does is the father then acts out the violence to the child at the behest of the mother. And what do we finish up thinking? Our oh, mum's the good cop and dad's the bad cop. That's what we end up thinking, right? That's what we end up feeling. Now, the, we could go on for ages on this list, could we not? Of all these beliefs. Now, the issue with all of these beliefs is, can you see what they do is they create a resistance in yourself, the child, they create a resistance in the child to ever touch any issue of, of, of feelings of anger or rage towards their mother. And woe betide if you cry about how bad your mother treated you. Right? Because that's really what this is about, preventing you from seeing the truth about how you've been treated. So, and I'm not saying all mothers are like this, but let's face it, it does happen. It, well, you know, as you've seen, this one here, threat of father's violence, happened to almost all of you from your mother. Can you see how this is a way of treating you in such a manner that you start taking on your mother's belief systems about your father? And you start taking on your mother's belief systems about religion. And you start taking on your mother's belief systems about pretty much everything. And woe is you if you ever disagree with your mother. We, uh, myself and Mary, we were listening to songs. Uh, Mary has been looking for songs about anger and rage and other issues with mother for her workshops. And, and we found hardly any at all. And what blew us away was we found hundreds of thousands of songs about how good mum is. Hundreds of thousands, literally, of songs about how good one is. And some of them were religious in nature. 
that actually God, there's God, and then there's other. <laughs> and then there's you. Right? And there is one song written for the Muslim community, actually, where they were singing about how you must respect your mother, which is obviously one of the basic tenets of the Muslim religion, as it is also one of the basic tenets of the Christian faith. And, and as a result of that, there's, this song was just saying how you could never, your mum carried you. You can never condemn her for anything she's done because of what she's done for you. And often you hear from mothers, I have sacrificed for you. Okay. Now it's interesting, isn't it? That many of us have had this from our own mothers, but now let's, many of us here in the audience are mothers. How many times have you done these things with your own children? You see? Can you see how straight away there's a dynamic that happens? Is while I'm reflecting upon my mother, I can own up to the fact that these things have happened in that relationship. But as soon as I become a mother, what does everybody say? Uh, I realised the instant I became a mother that I forgave my mother for everything she did. And do you know really what you, all you're doing there? Is you are forgiving yourself for your own unloving behaviour for what you're doing. That's all you're doing. Does that make sense? It's not very positive if you want to become at one with God doing that. All right? So here we have these, all these belief systems that all came from this person who had, a, let's call it, an 80% influence in our life. All right? So naturally we're going to take on many, many, if not all, of her belief systems. Now, some of us rebel. You try that and see how long you last. Have you tried? Who's tried rebelling against their mothers? How successful was it? The majority have tried it and it's not very successful. Mum just seems to be relentless. You notice that? <laughs> but what dad will do, what dad will do is he'll just give up on the first time you try, <laughs> most of the time, right? So, he, you know, it's rare for him. With my father, it's just like, right, I'm not speaking with you for the next seven years, that's it, right? <laughs> and so he didn't, you know, so... So that was easy to handle, wasn't it? Like, it's easy to handle that. You know where you stand. And this is the thing. With many men, you do know where you stand, even if it's unloving. You do know. Like when a man comes up and bops you in your nose, you know where you stand. Right? When the woman comes up and without you knowing, plans the rest of your life for you, <laughs> you've got no idea what's going on. Right? This is the truth. Many of you ladies have tried this, right? And can you see that much of this comes from the desire to control because of this feeling that inside of myself, if I don't control, I'm going to be hurt somehow. Can you see that? So, so while we may laugh about what's happening you know, in terms of the environment, the actual underlying emotions in many women are very sad and need to be addressed. And so this is part of what I want to discuss with you today how to help yourself address those particular emotions. But before we address the emotions, we've got to identify that they're there and we've got to be honest with ourselves that they're actually present. So, so what happens is 80% of the time, I'm now being influenced by mother, that means that 80% of the time I'm taking on her beliefs and, her and all of her issues and her problems and all sorts of things are being taken on by me at this point. Now this is the reason why initially when we start our emotional processing work, we feel that most of our problems are with our father. Because actually, our own emotional set, which is often in direct disharmony with love and God, most of it came from our mother. So I am in agreement with my mother, initially, in my growing life, most of the time. Can you see that? So I am actually quite blind to the fact, in this state, I am quite blind to the fact that I've actually got any issues with my mother because I am in agreement with her emotionally the majority of the time. Now, many of you mothers, if you feel your emotions when your children stop agreeing with you, many of you become highly distressed about that. Have you noticed that? You notice when you have an uh, anger-based situation or a son or a daughter starts confronting you emotionally, 
you notice how easy it is for you to feel very distressed about the situation. And the reason why is because you've had 80% of their agreement all of your life. And that's an addiction in you. It's, you've become addicted to actually having your children's agreement. And woe betide the child if they don't agree with you anymore. You go into this sad place initially and you start crying. And what do they feel? Oh, I'm now ma I'm making my mum sad is what is often... Right? Is that true? No. This sadness is already in your mother. It has been in her for generations, right? This sadness that is being triggered. But, but many mothers will go down the track, don't you do this to me? I'm your mother. Can you see all of this teaching that goes on so that you accept what your mother does even if it is unloving? So the truth is actually that we are more prepared to accept unloving behaviour from women than we are from men. This is as a generation. Right? So when a man is violent, we all condemn it. When a man does something, we all criticise it, condemn it, condemn him, judge him. Right? But what about the women who played a part in that violence? Now, to give you some, st some statistics, you can have a look on uh, the internet for some statistics about who gets to go to prison. And the majority of murderers on death row in the United States came from single-parent, mother-parent households. Right? I think it's as high as 90% of them. Right? Now, now, if you start looking at statistics like that, you start seeing, actually, the effect that these, these intergender emotional issues have on the next generation of people. And what I'd like to do is just show you for a moment how this gets infected down the chain. Now, one of the reasons why women now have this really, really deep emotion within them to not talk about women in a negative way, is because many women have had the, the experience of having the multi-generational abuse that's occurred over centuries. So in the spirit world right now, there are literally millions and millions of spirit, women spirits, who have been raped and abused the majority of their life who are now in the spirit world. Does that make sense? These come from the last three, three or four thousand years of humankind existence where the women were viewed as possessions and even if the woman was married to a man, and this was the case in my first century life, even if the woman was married to the man, the majority of the time she got raped. Right? She didn't have any desire for the man to have sex with him but he would just take what he wanted whenever he wanted it. That was her role. That was how, that was his, what, the whole reason why he bought her and paid the price of the bridal price to his, her parents. He bought her as a possession. Now, to be frank with you, this is still happening on earth as we speak. In the majority of the third, what we call the third world, and in many Asian nations and in much of the Middle East, a lot of this is still going on where women are being bought and sold. And in some countries, in some Asian countries for example, it's actually legal or it's probably more accurate to say it's not illegal to murder your wife. Right? And there's a lot of family vendetta type payback systems to the wife if she doesn't perform. And unfortunately, many times it's actually women of an older generation who perpetuate this violence against the next generation of women. Because they've endured so much of that in violence themselves, they feel quite jealous if the woman who is their daughter-in-law that's married their son gets treated nicely. And they feel quite in a rage with her because of the comparison between her own life and the life of her, of her daughter-in-law. And this is where, you know, we get the old terms like, you know, the mother-in-law is always 
cried often thought to be the most difficult person to handle in any marriage. Isn't that the case? And why is that? Because, because many times, whether it's the male who's in the marriage or the female that's in the marriage, there's this really deep emotional connection with the mother. So if I'm the male in the marriage and I've got a very deep emotional connection to my mother, then is Mary going to be able to compete with that? Well, there's going to be times when she won't compete with it, where she will feel second best, is there not? Which created, straight away creates a rift in the marriage relationship, in the, in the partnership between male and female. And vice versa is often the case too. Many women grow up feeling they never want to be like their mothers, but often feel very addicted to pleasing their mother's emotions. So if mum, you know, the person who can hurt you the most is usually your mother. And in fact, many uh, people who grow up and actually have a, um, a, a emotional problems that they've got to deal with or depression that they've got to deal with, oftentimes it's about the suppression of rage they have towards their mothers. That it, they, they don't suppress the rage towards their fathers because they allow themselves to experience that and express that but they suppress deeply their rage towards their mothers. Does that make sense? Which creates depression. You want to ask a question? If we just have a, just be careful of this. Uh, video there. Yeah. Uh, hello, AJ. I'm, I'm Terry. I'm new here. Um, this, my mother passed over when I was seven years of age, mm -hmm. and I have no memories at all of her. Would this be the reason why I'm blocking all this? A lot of times it is. But, but I feel for you, there's this specific grief about your mother's passing that right. causes you to not have a memory of her. Right. And, and see, a lot of times when, when our mothers pass, when we're quite young, if we're, if we're growing up in a relationship where the father feels he loves her, there's often a lot of uh, shutdown from the father about grieving the mother's mm. passing, and that affects all of his sons uh, markedly. Like, so... I feel for yourself it's not really about your the harm that mother's brought so much because mm. I actually can feel your mother with you and she actually loves you quite deeply and has been with you all of the rest of your life. Um, but I do feel the shutdown that you have is more about the issue of, of not wanting to grieve her passing. Thank mm. you. Yep. Um, anyone else? Kelly, thanks up the back there. Um, for me, I've had a, you know, a lot of anger towards men, but I've been angry towards my mother most of my life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she's the one that I've sort of thought, oh, it's wrong because I've had so much um, anger towards her. So, what's happening there? I've got sort of, even though I've got it towards my dad, I've got it, had it mostly on my mum. Well, what I would like to do, Kelly, is address the issue of anger um, a little separate to the discussion in a minute. So, okay. Because the issue of anger is more about the choices that you're making inside of your own soul than it is about whether the issue is with your mum or your dad. Right. But, but the truth is, for most of us, we identify heavily with our mother's emotions. And that includes our mother's emotions towards her father. All right? Yeah. So um, before we even begin having a relationship often with our own father, we've already accepted through the nine months of pregnancy my mother's emotions with her father. Can you see? So straight away there is almost a resistance in our soul to even having a relationship with our own father if our own mothers have had a different, difficult relationship with their father. Well, her dad died um, when she was three. All right. So the difficult relationship being there, that she never had one. Yeah. So, so the fact that, you know, what, during her formative years, uh, f particularly from three onwards, she never had a relationship with the father. She would have feelings of being abandoned by the male and all those kind of things. And, and all of those emotions that she's yet to release or hasn't released yeah. are automatically absorbed by your soul at the moment you incarnated, at the moment you were conceived. Yeah. And from that moment onwards, you're absorbing all of these emotions that mummy has.
towards her dad. And one of those major emotions would be a feeling that dad abandoned her and rejected her, even though he died and didn't have much control over that. Yeah. That's the emotion she has. But, but there's not only that, there's also these multi-generational, thousands of year based emotions that most women on the planet also carry. This, these are the unfortunate results of man's dominance over women during that period of time. So the, the problem with males, or with any gender dominating any other gender, is the following generations deal with the aftermath of it. And so what happened during this period of time, these thousands of years where male dominated female, men took women as they wanted them, did what they wanted with them, discarded them when they wanted to, what happened during that period of time is this multi-generational rage has developed in women for many, many, many generations of how men have treated us, how men have controlled us and treated us and abused us and raped us and tortured us and done all of those kind of things. And even this generation of women who, who for many personally have not had that particular experience have got that emotion in them automatically because it's never been released by the previous generation of women. And by the way, the current generation of men, many of them have a very emasculated uh, viewpoint of themselves. And the reason why that is, is because they have accepted many times 80% of their mother's emotions about men. And mum's emotions about men that are unhealed are often quite rageful about men. And so then the male feels quite identif identifies with the mother rather than the father. Now, many of you men in this audience have done that. You've identified more with your mother's emotions than your father's in terms of a sense of approval. And that also automatically means that you're going to enter placating re relationships with women, where you placate the woman even if she's in a rage, because you actually identify with the woman in a rage more than you do the male in a rage. Because when you were a child growing up, you saw dad in a rage, and he was violent and angry with you as well, and you rejected the male in a rage, and you felt sorry for your mother's. And then you finish up attracting a rageful woman into your life and to help you overcome sorrow you have towards your mothers that you need to actually address and feel inside of yourself. And so often what happens even if we're a male, we also identify strongly with our mothers. And this is why many men, even as they're growing up as adults, refuse to tell their mothers the truth. Right? Because they can't handle the results of mum's disapproval. They can't handle it emotionally inside of themselves. So they don't tell mum the truth. You know, so they go off and sneak off and have a relationship. They don't take her home to mum. You know, they go off and do some other things, some scary things like skydiving and rock climbing and all those other things. But they, they, they tell mum about it? No, nah, you've got to keep that away from mum because mum would just go ballistic on that one. You know? And so you, they finish up, many of the men keep things away, learn from a very young age to keep things away from mum. So what do you think they're going to do with their wives? So here, here we are often as the final generation, the generation that's here present right now. As a woman, you're often getting angry with a man for being a liar, right? You created the liar. You see, it was the previous generation of women that created this liar. Does that make sense? The beauty of all the emotions that are currently in the current generation is they are all present to correct the previous generation's mistakes. And as long as we start owning them as individuals, we will heal all of this. We will heal every single bit of intergenerational and intergender emotional issues, which is what we need to do on this planet for the next generation to actually love each other as males and females. That's what we need to do. While we hold on to all of these belief systems about holding on to mum's belief systems, what we're actually doing is perpetuating the cycle of intergender violence that occurs on the planet. And I classify any verbal disagreement between the genders as intergender violence, besides physical. So why do you think you have an argument at home when you're married? It's because of the intergender emotional issues that are not being resolved by both parties in the marriage. And they, a lot of that comes from dealing with these emotions related. Now, we often deal with the emotions relating to dad because often we're allowed to be in a rage with dad. In fact, many of your own fathers have allowed you to be in a rage with them. 
right, for many years. And they, they say they don't care, right? Obviously they do at some level, but many of them act like they don't. And so what finishes up happening inside of us is we feel free to deal with, particularly the anger about men, we feel free to deal with, but we don't feel free to deal with the anger about women. Right? So what we do instead is we suppress that anger about women. Now, when you suppress anger, what finishes up developing is called resentment. Right? That's what finishes up happening. Now, if you're a woman suppressing anger towards mother, you're going to end up resenting yourself as a woman as well as your mother. Does that make sense? It's the same if you're a man suppressing your anger towards your father. You're going to end up resenting yourself as a male as well as your father. Right? It's the same thing. It's the same, it happens in the, same, in the same way in both genders. So, so if I'm suppressing, as a, as a female, I'm suppressing my anger towards my mother because I always feel like I've got to do what she wants, I've always got to please her, you know, she's always at me, you know, you never were a very good child anyway, and you never did this and never did that. You've got to listen to your mother. And a lot of it even is more subversive than that. The problem is, is a lot of the times, if it was overtly abusive, we would know that it's overtly abusive and we would be okay, we would, we would say, yes, my mother was overtly abusive to me. We would. And we would start to deal with those emotions. The most difficult emotions you will ever face your entire life are the ones that are subversive. The ones that are actually all of the hidden underlying messages, you know? The kind of thing where you look in the mirror and mum walks past you and says, it's what's inside that counts. Uh, well, you're looking in the mirror at yourself and your mum walks past you and says, it's what's inside that counts. What's the message? <laughs> Doesn't matter how good I'm looking on the outside, man. What's inside's dirty, rotten, scoundrel. You know, like, that's the message, really. That's the feeling that comes up a lot of the times when that's set. And... There's all these messages that often come from a mother in a very hidden way even. So what's the message of, you know, wait till your dad gets home? Now, th there are literally like 20 or 30 messages in that one single statement. Wait till your dad gets home. Let's have a look at that one. Wait till your dad gets home. I'm really saying to you, as my, I'm, if I'm the mother saying that to you, I'm really saying to you that I have control of your father. That's one of the messages. I can, I can turn on the switch in him and he'll belt you for me. That's the message. Right? You can be protected by pleasing me. That's the message too. If you please me as your mother, then I can turn this switch off in your dad and he won't belt you. That's also part of the message. Can you see there's quite a lot of messages in this. Right? I'm actually saying that I'm also the dominant person in this entire family. That's what I'm telling my child. I, the woman is the dominant person in the family. The hidden message in that is, if the woman isn't made to be the dominant person, then we've got a problem in the relationship. So many women grow up feeling that if they're not the dominant person in a relationship, then the relationship's not good for them and they go and find a place, a relationship that they can be the most dominant person in as a result of that one message. So you, you, can you see just that one message has all of these hidden agendas? They're informing you, they're informing you of how you should believe mum to be. And the only reason why mum wants to do any of this, there's only one reason why mum wants to do any of this, and that is she doesn't want to feel her own grief. She doesn't want to feel her own emotions about herself. So what she does is through this issue, through these methods of control, you see, a man, due to generally his larger physical stature, a man is able to control by force. So, so how does a male control a household? If he's abusive, what he does is he comes home and just hits a few people around. Then he gets what he wants. Either that or they leave and then he never gets what he wants. One of the two. But, but he is often very overt in his dominance, right? 
because he can get away with it physically. Now the laws in many countries, not in, not in many of the thir so-called third world or the eastern countries, but the court laws in the western countries now prevent the male to a degree from doing any of these things. But the males still do it, don't they? They even have the threat of getting put in jail and they still do it. Right? So, so there's that issue. So he, but he, but there, it's very obvious in that situation who the unloving person is, is it not? <laughs> really obvious. But what if mum is controlling dad to smack you or to beat you? Now, isn't your mum actually in a more difficult situation with God than dad in that situation? He is being led by the mother into doing something towards you, but it's the mum that actually has control of the entire situation. Now, where did mum learn this control? Well, she learnt to have this control, this subversive control, through literally generations of violent abuse. She learnt that she had to use her words and she had to be conniving and she had to be devious and she had to use all these other techniques other than overt violence to control her environment. So that's part of the sadness here, isn't it? That we've got generations and generations and generations of women who have had to use devious means to control their environment because they couldn't overtly just come out and say to the guy, I'm not having sex with you tonight. I don't actually like you. <laughs> and I don't want to be married to you anymore. Let's get a divorce. Right? Now, now, the majority of women in history who ever said that were instantly stoned to death. And their, and their own fear of their own death caused them to stay in relationships that were damaging to themselves. Which you can understand, can you not? If you're afraid of dying, you're going to automatically do that, probably. So we've had generations and generations and generations and generations of that so this is why, ladies, you are far better at lying generally than a man is. Right? And there are statistics that can, you can read that will actually prove that. You lie perhaps less than a male will in a Western society. But in a, in a other society, you may lie more. Right? And the reason why is it's the only way to control a situation. Can you see? It's the only way to control so, so, of course we're going to do these things. Now, this is not judging any of these things. I'm just stating the truth about what happens and how it got created. We also have an additional problem. As, as a woman, there's this additional problem. This is what it is. It is the literally thousands of years of religious abuse you've received. You understand? Let's look at the religious abuse that you've received. In almost any religion, you are treated as a lesser person than the male. Is that not the case? Let's look at the Christian faith. The Christian faith, the Apostle Paul said, in first, I think it's 1 Corinthians, he says, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach in the congregation. He was a male making a ruling against the female teaching which was in direct contradiction to my own teachings when I was in the first century about the woman. And yet who, what do many Christian religions do today? Exactly the same thing. It's obviously unloving. So teaching in the congregation from a Christian perspective a woman's not allowed to do that, really. If, they, if a person is a fundamentalist and looks at the Bible very strictly, they will have to come to that conclusion. All right. There's also who oversees the, or oversights the congregation. There's another scripture, Apostle Paul again wrote it. He says, a elder or an overseer in the congregation or a priest in the congregation, that's in some translations, he says a priest in the congregation shall be the husband of one wife. Well, what does that tell you? It can't be the wife of one husband. So in other words, the priest has to be a male. 
right? Ironically, if they read that Bible scripture, they would see that priests are allowed to be married. But anyway, it's interesting. So it's interesting how we take some things out of even written words like the Bible and we then apply them and before you know it, it all gets mixed up. And in reality, the Bible never actually said what's now being practised. But that's frequent as well. But here we go in a Christian religion. She's not allowed to teach. She's also not allowed to be a priest. Right? Now, um, there are scriptures that tell that, uh, that, the, that the woman is allowed to be a person that gives alms and assistance to others. Alms, A-L-M-S, and assistance to others. And so she is allowed to be a caregiver. All right. All right. What else uh, do we find in Christian religion? Um, historically, we have people like Luther and almost all the popes saying that women are disgusting because they cause unholy erections in men. <laughs> yeah, that's something Luther said. Um, I can actually read a long list of things Luther said. By the way, Luther is one of our celestial brothers and sisters now. So he's a celestial brother. But when he was on the earth, he wasn't that conciliatory towards women. And he said, actually, that a woman's only role is to, be, to prepare the meals and be a um, companion and caregiver to the man's children. Even the male owned the children. In our life, in our first century life, the men owned the children. If you stepped out of the line as a woman, the first thing that would happen to you is your, you would never see your children again. So do you think most women stepped out of line? Never stepped out of line. All right. So, so what do we have there? Now we're starting to look at all of these things about sex. In other words, the women are the persons who are creators of the man's lust. Now, can you see these patterns? These are patterns in the Christian faith, right, that have been there now for, what, 2,000 years, right? They all began about 300 years after my death, so about 300 CE, and since then all of these teachings came into, into play. Now, you compare that with the Muslim faith. So, so what do we see? Exactly the same Thing, do we not? Exactly the same. So we see this same side of where the woman's not permitted to teach, or if she is, she has a lesser position as a teacher. She's not really allowed to be the, the person that's leading the flock. They're all men, are they not? All men. And when it comes to sex, what has she got to do? The man's fine wearing whatever he wants, but the woman has to, well, she wears whatever she wants under it. But she puts over it the cloak of invisibility so that basically you can't see any of her aside from her eyes in many cases. Why? Because this has been part of the dominance of the woman. Now, now if you've, there's literally three billion people on this planet right at this moment, half, almost half of the world's population who have these belief systems right, right now. So how many do you think have passed that still have the same belief systems in the last 2,000 years? Large amounts, right? Now, every one of those women even fully believe their own belief system many times. Right? And there's this pressure now on the next generation to not give up these belief systems as a result. And the problem is, is that while we have all of these belief systems that are actually attacking the woman, we also get this finish up, this swing of rage from the women themselves. Can you understand why? Of course. Of course you can understand why. And this has been my problem most of my life. I've, I've understand the woman's rage perfectly. But that doesn't mean I deserve it from you. Does that make sense? And this is where we need to address. So, so what happens is religion has dominated women to its own detriment. How many of you feel really attracted, as women I'm talking, feel attracted to the Christian faith? 
Now, many of you will not feel attracted to the Christian faith because of the dominance of the male. Now, how many of you feel attracted to the Muslim faith? It's the same, isn't it? Not many because of the dominance of the male. Now, if you grow up in those environments, obviously it's going to be different. But here in Australia, because of our freedom of religion, most of us have given up the prospect of these faiths because of what we can feel is the error and the lack of love in them. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some faiths that are loving in their nature, but if we look at what's going on, the messages that are given between the generation, the, the genders, sorry, we can see there's this huge problems between the genders, isn't there? If you're a Buddhist and you grow up, almost every single Buddhist leader is celibate. Whether they be male or female. What is that telling you? That's telling you that sex is wrong. Now most of them are male. So what is that telling you? That for a male to be holy, he can't have sex with a woman. That's what it's telling you. There's all these hidden messages, you see. All these messages coming out, hitting us emotionally. And, and so what we finish up happening is that there's all this stuff towards the genders. But there is a lot of stuff that over thousands of years have been dumped on the women. And as a result of that, women in the current generation have now got literally hundreds of millions of spirits who are still angry about this system, systemic abuse of the whole gender. Does that make sense? Now what that does is it means this. Here's me as a woman, let's say. Let's say I'm a woman here on earth and I'm connecting to my anger with my father. How many spirits will be helping me do this? I'll help be surrounded by women spirits and even some men spirits who agree with the women spirits who have all had issues with their fathers all influencing me to stay in anger. They don't want me to get out of it because if I get out of it, they can't express it themselves anymore through me. And so they want me to stay in it. They want me to stay in rage, stay in rage, stay in rage for the rest of my existence. That's what they would prefer. The reason why they'd prefer that, by the way, just as an aside, is where spirits pass, if you're in a rage, what happens when you pass is you pass into a location of the spirit world where every other person there is also in the same kind of rage that you are. So if I'm in a rage with males and I'm a woman, I will attract a location in the spirit world, in the hells of the spirit world, that there are large groups of women there and they're all in a rage with men. Does that make sense? That's what I'll attract. And the only men that will ever come into our, my sphere, or my, my existence, when I'm in the spirit world in that location, is any man who believes you, he deserves your rage. That's the only man that will ever walk past you in the spirit world. Now because of that, I'm surrounded by women, but there's no men for an outlet of my rage. Can you see? There's no men there that I can outlet this rage onto because I just want to stay in the rage. I don't want to feel the grief of it. And all I want to do is I outlet. I want, to, I want to scream and yell at some men. That's what I feel like I want. And so what they do is they feel attracted to a woman who they can earth and they actually then use her as the outlet of their rage towards men. Does that make sense to everyone? Because they, where they are, can't do that. So they have to use somebody here on earth to do that. And the reason why they can't do it where they are is because there is no men to do it towards where they are because of their law of attraction. Now, if they, instead of doing that, instead of focused on their grief towards the male, they would actually get into a state of love very quickly and leave that entire location. So they can progress out of that location very rapidly. But they don't want to do that either. And the reason why, if we look at the reasons for women's anger, ladies, you know what they are, so what are, why, why are you angry? 
Who would like to start? Ladies only. Why are you angry? D, because you've been controlled? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I would argue with you that's not the case. I would say, actually, because it's the best way of controlling. Does that make sense? When I get angry, I control everyone around me. So I am, can you see how I'm just reflecting this back at you? I am controlling. I want control. It would be better to say probably I want control. You see, you see, if men had been controlling in my life and I was prepared to grieve that rather than get angry about it, then I would never get into anger. I would just cry about the control and release that emotion. And ironically, once that emotion is released, I would no longer be attracting controlling men into my life anyway. And to be frank with you, many of you are not attracting controlling men into your life at all. You're attracting men who you can control into your life. That's the truth. And that's because you want control. And what that means is that you feel out of control inside of yourself and you want a male you can control. And, and if he does something that stops that control from happening, what can you do to get back the situation? Be angry. If you, if you have a man who's a passive man or a man who's pacifying the woman in your life, all you need to do to control him is be angry with him. Now you've got control back. Right? So I want control. What else, do you, what else would you want if you've been abused all your life? And generationally, most women have. A security? And protection? And some have mentioned revenge. So we want power. Um, so what's the opposite of vulnerability? You see, strength is not the opposite of vulnerability. Actually, being vulnerable is the strongest place you can ever be in. So strength isn't the op this is one of the false beliefs we have. The opposite of vulnerability is control, <laughs> is it not? Right. You don't want to be open to everything happening. You want to be in control of everything happening. Right. Karen, up the back there. Or just yell it out, Karen, if, you, if it's short. No, it's not going to be short, so we can have the mic up. I didn't recognise I was angry until recently when I realised that every time I withdraw, I'm angry. So just withdrawing is... Yep. So what does withdrawing give you? Well, it gives you power and control, but what else does it give you? What, what's the feeling you have when you withdraw? Well, I always thought I was just keeping to myself and not doing anything, but I only realised lately that every time I withdraw, I'm projecting anger. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. And I guess that controls people. So, so when you withdraw, you're protecting yourself from that particular situation, basically, aren't you? I thought I was, yeah. Yeah. Every time you withdraw, you step back from the situation. Yeah. Why would you step back from the situation? Because the situation is confronting in some way. Yeah. And um, there's some other things not mentioned yet. What other? If you've been sexually and otherwise abused all of your life, what are the kinds of things you want to do? What are, what are the things you want to have in your life? Um, go to Angela up the back there, if we can have a mic there. I was going to say that you want to punish, but you, I don't yep. know. So that's really revenge, punishment? Oh, sorry, I didn't see revenge. Blame can all come under there, don't you? All come under revenge. We want to get the person back. We want to punish all men for what's happened here, yeah? Anything else? Love. You want love? Well, I'm not talking the pure love. I'm talking a distorted love. So what kind of love do you want? Anything. So let's look at it, yeah. <laughs> so we want, so we want, uh, so we're up to six now. We want attention. 
Right? And we might keep going. Feel that as love. What else might we want? Recognition. Recognition. Sympathy. Sympathy. To feel special. No. Okay, my friend says romance. <laughs> you want romance? Yeah, I'd say a desire for all these things is never going to give you any romance, actually. <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, these are just some of them, right? These are just some of the feelings that would be pre there, you see? And if I don't want to feel these things, so in other words, if I don't want to feel unsafe, if I don't want to feel powerless, if I, if, I don't want to, if I don't have the mechanism for revenge, if, I don't have, if I'm not getting the attention and the recognition and the sympathy from the male that I want, what is going to be my first thing that I will do? Just get angry with him. Tell him he's a bastard and get out of my life and I'll go and find another guy who do that for me. Right? Not understanding, actually, that this is all this multi-generational injury that needs to come out of me and be released out of me. Now, to be frank with you ladies, what I've found is the majority of women on the, and, and my, she, she's, she's sad because of mum's emotions about men here. So if you just let yourself feel that. Interesting. My girl's taken her out. So these, all of these emotions, they're all multi-generational emotions sitting inside of us and sitting inside of most women, right? And you can see why when you've had years and years and years and years and years and years of punishment and abuse and, and, and sexual abuse and rape and, you know, all these different things that have happened to your life, you've been never noticed, never, you've been treated as, as, as just possessions, of course you're going to have a group of emotions like this. Does that make sense? However, one thing I would like to point out to you is that while these emotions are in you, the only person who can release them from you is you. So it doesn't matter how angry you get at the male, it's still not going to get you closer to God or closer to not having one of those emotions in you. Does that make sense? It's only going to actually make your soul condition worse rather than better. Now, what, what I've found happen, what is happening with many women on the divine love path is they start getting to this group of emotions and they spit the dummy, as the saying goes. <laughs> right? They get very angry, very upset. They want to look for the nearest male who will actually give them a justification for that upset and anger and then just hammer him for it and then leave the whole thing and even leave the divine love path as a result of these emotions. And I have found that actually there's been very few women that have gotten through these emotions and out the other side of them. And this is the danger for you ladies. Many of you are coming up to these emotions. Many of you are in danger of just staying in them. Right, rather than actually feeling the grief that's underneath them. Now, one of the reasons why you're in danger of staying in them is because there's this whole group of spirits around you who want you to stay in them. Like, they've, they've been the ones who have personally had to endure this generations of abuse by the male. And they feel totally justified in helping you stay in this rage with the male. And they want you to stay in this rage with the male. And you'll notice how women seem to have a camaraderie between themselves about staying in these emotions. Do you notice that? And you might even notice that inside of yourself. Now, oftentimes also in this place, I attract a male who will accept me in this place. That means I'm going to attract a male who actually will let me have control. He will try to make me feel nice and safe and secure. He will allow me to blame him for things that are not even his fault. He will allow me to take power in the relationship through anger. 
He will give me all the attention. He'll, he'll, he'll worship me right, and give me all the attention and recognition I need. And when, he, when I'm crying, he sits there with me and listens to me crying and tries to hug me and hug me out of my crying. And he tries to make me feel special. That's the kind of man that I'm going to attract. And you know what I'm going to do with him? I'm going to turn him into another abuser by my actions. Because if I don't release those emotions, he is going to eventually leave, if it's not here or it be in the, when he arrives in the spirit world, and he is going to be in a rage with women as a result of my actions. Can you see all I'm doing is perpetuating the cycle of violence between the genders? That's all I'm doing. So what happened, uh, what's happened with myself and Mary quite frequently is uh, a few months ago we'd drive along in the car and, and all of a sudden I just saw Mary go into this real angry place with the male and felt this large number of spirits around her and she did too. And so we started talking to these spirits and these spirit, her hook into the spirits was she wanted the woman's approval. So you notice this happening on earth a lot. One angry woman, what does she do? She rings up all of her friends, right, and puts that anger into that relationship so that all the friends, what's the desire? The friends all agree with her and now she has a justification for her anger that she doesn't have to release. Does that make sense? Now, you don't see men doing this quite as frequently because what happens with most men when they're angry is they just go and bop the person in the nose that they're angry with or they yell and scream and tirade for a while and then they're over it, right, for most men. And so most men are more overt with their rage than women are. But what a woman will do is stay in this rage and talk to all of her friends so now she's got a whole group of friends who also agree with her position. Why does she do that? Because it makes her position stronger. It makes her feel like, yes, she's done the right thing. I've done the right thing here. Yeah, the bloody men, you know, they did this and they did that or whatever. So can you see how straight away what I'm doing when I'm doing that is I'm influencing other women to also be in the same rage that I'm in and I'm using the hook of we us girls have got to stick together against the male gender. Does that make sense? And what we finish up doing in that state is we create a wall or a barrier between that group of people and the opposite gender. Right. And when we do that, do you think we're ever going to be at one with God in that place? Ever? No, never. And we, do you think we're ever going to be at one with our soulmate in that place? Never. And do you think we're ever going to really attract our soulmate to our lives in that condition? Probably not. Right. And the reason why is there's just this huge amount of stuff coming out of me right towards the opposite gender that I'm not and my hook is to please the other women in the environment so oftentimes what happens in many of the situations this has happened in quite a number of workshops as well that Mary's done where women have made a pact between each other that if one of them gets sent home the other one will go home with them right because there's these uh, there's these pacts that are made right to support each other's emotional error. That's the whole reason for these packs. Avoid the process of confronting our emotional errors. Now, most of us are surrounded by large numbers of spirits. Now, if I'm attracting this on the earth, I'm also going to be attracting a heap of spirits in the spirit world who also want us to avoid dealing with these emotional errors that we feel, this, this projection onto the universe that the universe has got to, I've got to have control of the universe and I've got, the universe has got to make me safe and secure and I want revenge on anybody who's done anything wrong to me and I'm going to plot that revenge to the greatest intricate degree and make them all pay, you know. And, and like, again, the man generally in his own rage will go and just bop the person in the nose. In a part of that, the emotion gets released and, and so he doesn't feel like planning the revenge for the whole of the rest of the person's life, generally. Right? But many women, because of the feeling of control that they've never had all their life, they do feel like wanting to damage the rest of this person's life. 
right? They do feel that. And this is the reason why. And often the reason why too is because we've got a whole group of spirits with us in exactly the same place. Plotting and conniving and experiencing the same group of emotions that, or when I say experiencing, living in rather than releasing the same group of emotions that we need to release. So this, for this reason, it's very rare for a woman on earth and there's yet to be on this planet a woman on earth who has ever gotten through these emotions. Huh? Okay. By the way, there's only ever been one man who's got through them either. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's like... And it's not a comparison anyway. It's also, it's about or why. Why? The reason why is because there's this huge, huge projection from the spirit world, don't you touch mother. Don't you touch mother's emotions. Don't you go and say anything wrong about your mother. Right? If you do, even the men will protect the mother. Right? And you look at that happening in the family. You can see that happening. I got that really strongly over the weekend. I got a very much a don't you dare go there. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's quite strong. Yeah, and how many of you are more afraid of a woman's anger than a man's? I've been in my life. And the main reason why is because the woman's rage, because it doesn't get released through action a lot of the times, becomes very, um, well, yeah, it's like, it's like no, what is it? No hell has, a, has, hell has no fury as a woman's scorn. And, and that is often the case, isn't it? That, that a woman in this place can become very cold and calculating. Males are not very good at cold and calculating. They're mostly good at overt violence, right? But not very good at cold calculating planning in many cases. Well, you look at almost all of the violent mur the murders towards the opposite gender, the ones the males have committed have usually been done in a rage. The ones towards the from the that have done, been done by females have usually been done meticulously planned. We have a mic to have a look. That just reminded me, AJ, a friend of mine in New Zealand, she is a prison officer. Mm -hmm. And when I realised, a few years ago, when I realised that she was talking about being that, I said, are you in a woman's prison? And she said, no way. She was in a male prison, mm -hmm. high security prison. And what she said was basically, when they do something that really, her words were, a noise or um, really upsets a male prisoner, they strike out and let it go straight away. Mm. But she said with the female prisoners, she said that they harbour it and they'll come back even stronger and get them, yep. basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is because of the, and understand ladies, this is not something that's a part of your basic nature. Do you understand? This is not what femininity is about. Femininity doesn't do this. This is about an emotional injury caused by generations and generations of abuse towards the female that's being played out. That's all it's about. So it's not, so I'm not saying here that any of these things are a part of your true feminine nature. So please understand that. These things are all just a part of the multi-generational intergender abuse that occurs towards the female. That's what they're a part of. I was doing this, um, telling my friends, you know, going on and on. I did it in my marriage. Then I did it, continued with the same pattern. However, what happened this time, it all backfired in me. And so now what I'm doing is shut my mouth, feel it. Then I go and ring a man up and ask from a man's point of view what to do with communicating. You felt it completely from his perspective. Yeah. Yeah. What is, is he that feel okay? Yeah, that's, that's a lot better than doing the other, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> it's like if I, if I have issues with women that women can feel, then obviously if I go to a woman and, and feel them, 
and then the woman might be able to tell me what's going on if she's not enraged with a man already. What I notice a lot happening though with uh, many of the ladies in the audience is that, is that they, they go up to the male and say, oh, you're angry with women. When in reality what I feel from the male is this deep sadness with the woman from having to do what the woman says all of their life. And I don't feel much anger in them. And so a lot of the times what happens is that we often impose our belief systems emotionally upon the opposite gender. And, and in the reality is many women hate feeling the sadness of the male. And the reason why is that there is this underlying knowing that much of this male's sadness results from how their mothers have treated them. Does that make sense? And so they know that a woman was the cause of it at some level. And, and, and underneath that, there's this sort of feeling of, well, I don't want to feel blame as a woman for my male's sadness. And instead, the answer is to get angry with him being sad. And many uh, of you are attempting to do that at times, get angry with the man for being sad and blame the man for being angry when in reality he's really deeply hurt and sad. Does that make sense? So there's those kind of emotions present as well. And if we go straight uh, Anna, and then down the front. AJ, me and, um, me and Tris have that. We were talking about it last night where yep. Tris starts talking about his mum and I feel so bad about myself because I feel like, like I feel blamed. Yes. So what is like, is the key there for me? Because like it's just feeling bad about myself. Is that sort of a self-deception or like what? what well, no, part of it then? is your mum's feeling bad about herself that you have taken on, obviously. So the key is to allow yourself to feel the grief as a woman that a male has been treated that way by his mother. Does that make sense? So if it triggers any emotion inside of you, instead of fighting the emotion of shame, just allow yourself to feel it. But understand that that probably also means that you have some women's spirits with you who have treated men in the manner that Tristan has been treated. Does that make sense in the past? And you're often connecting with their feelings that how dare he blame me? And then the anger arises instead of allowing the sadness. The key, the key is if you allow the grief, even the grief that you are to blame, even though you're not, obviously Tristan's not saying you are in that moment, but you feel you are in that moment. How can you be logically? You don't even have children of your own. So how can you be logically to blame for Tristan's stuff that he's got before he even met you? Logically, you can't be. But the fact that you feel to blame means that there is the emotion there that's present. Now, now look at whether you're taking on the women's spirits' emotions with you or whether it's actually your own mother's emotion. And allow yourself to feel it either way, but look at whether it's coming from one of those two sources. Right? The fact that the anger comes up is demonstrating there's an emotion inside of you you don't want to feel. And that's the thing to go for every time, rather than choosing to get angry with the male. Because all that does is it shuts down the male from feeling his grief towards the female. What's going to happen then is he's going to start getting angry more because he feels more and more frustrated that he can't grieve. Does that make sense? And he's not even grieving about you, he's grieving about his mother. So. And this is the thing, remember in all of the relationships, what's mostly going on is here's, here's my, myself, the male in the relationship, here's Mary, the female in the relationship, and what we're doing often is Mary is seeing me through her father's image. Does that make sense? And actually seeing me the way her mother sees her father is probably even more accurate considering the 80, 20, 80% 80 of its mum's emotions. And all I'm doing is seeing Mary through my mother's image. Does that make sense? So here's my mother and I'm seeing her th through my mother's image and beliefs. And often what's happening is when I don't allow Mary to grieve her stuff with men, what I'm doing is I'm preventing her from releasing grief. All she's going to do after that is get angry. Because where can her grief go? It can't go anywhere now. And what's on top of grief is fear and anger generally. So all we do is we get into rage when we can't feel our grief. So I would look, look, look firstly at how your mother feels about herself when she's with men, number one. And you know that mum feels quite bad about herself with men and you can see that in your, her treatment of your brothers. 
like her, her brothers, your brothers, her sons dominate mum to a degree with regard to their emotions. You can see that she must feel bad about men as a result of that. Uh, well, created, that's what's creating that. And so that means that you feel like you're responsible for some of the man's pain. So just allow, even though you're not, you need to allow yourself to feel that emotion. Does that make sense? Because the emotion is inside of you and needs to come out. But if you say, oh, I'm not to blame for this, you know, how do you, you know, start crying. And he's not even crying about you, he's crying about his mother. But, but the fact that you're taking it on means that there is, must be a camaraderie emotionally between you and Tristan's mother. Is it? Well, there's some camaraderie. There's some support of the mother. Oh, I feel defensive about the mother. And remember, this is all about the mother taboo. Taboo meaning, of course, I feel really defensive every time mother comes up. Really defensive. I want to defend mum. So, so what we even find in, male, in males who have been, like, had abusive fathers is they're constantly defending their mothers. But why didn't their mother take them out of the abusive environment? Why didn't their mother leave? And, he, and, the, and the male who we're trying to assist emotionally will come up with a thousand reasons why she shouldn't have had to leave. All right? and it, but he won't deal with the fact that mum didn't leave. He won't deal with that emotionally because he's hooked into uh, m no, mum's sacred ground. I can't go there. Mum, my feelings towards mum's sacred. I can't go there. It has to be about dad every time. You know? And so if, if you're feeling... Block, whenever Tristan cries about the female, about his mum, and you're feeling blocked towards that, resistive towards that, or angry about that at any point, then you know there's something there for yourself to look at about how you believe women are yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't feel defensive. Does that make sense? Yeah. If we can just get the mic, if you know. I just think I, I need a little bit of time to saturate it. I'm feeling pretty blocked through it at the moment. Yeah, um, and, and the truth is for many of you ladies at the moment, there is a heavy spirit influence shutting, trying to shut you down on this matter. How many of you have headaches, by the way? <laughs> yeah. Ladies, I'm talking. Yeah, quite a few. And this is, this is like the heavy spirit influence that starts occurring when we start raising this subject. Mary has found in the workshops that, that the entire workshop goes really... Uh, like it goes from being high to going uh, nobody wants to look at the mother stuff right? nobody wants to even touch that area so so can you see what i've covered so far is why we have this stuff with mum and why it's so large you can see the reasons why practically what's going on there can you also see that the many of the emotional injuries that mothers have relate to multi-generational abuse at the hands of males. So therefore, large amounts of rage towards the male in particular, right? And resistance towards feeling any grief about that. And then there's all of the controls that they have in place to make sure that they never have to feel any of those emotions again. And those are being projected at you constantly. Now, because of that, the majority of us, when we begin our processing, as I've already mentioned, have no idea that actually the mountain of stuff we have emotionally is more about our mother than our father. Right? And so the majority of us feel actually, I've got almost nothing with my mother. That's what we feel, the majority of people. And even men who have been placating their mothers all of their lives have grow up saying, no, no, I don't have any problems with mum at all. Like, and the reason why is because a person who's placated gives you what? They give you the reward of the placation. It's not love, by the way. It's like not the kind of love we're talking about, is it? It's, it's rewarding them getting what they want. So in other words, the entire life, your mother generally has projected at her children to give her what she wants because she didn't get that from her life, from her husband or a father or a mother. And so she's projecting that at the child. And because the children are the persons who are dominantly in her life, of course that's going to happen. Because it's not the male who's sitting home doing the washing and the ironing and the cleaning 
and the looking after the children and all those kind of things generally, it's still often the female doing those things. And so because the female is doing those things, the person she associates with the most is her children. And so her children are going to become the persons who she tries to get most of her emotional addictions met from. And as a child, if you meet those addictions, you will receive approval. And while you've got mum's approval, everything is fine. Everything's sweet. Right? But as soon as you no longer give mum the approval or the addictions that she wants met, what happens then? Now then you do experience generally the wrath that is underneath those emotions. <laughs> she turns into a dragon. What did you call your mum sometimes? Oh, wait, I probably shouldn't say it. <laughs> do you mind? <laughs> he minds. <laughs> but all of a sudden, you're, often your mum goes from this sweet, loving, caring, seemingly caring individual to this, you know, like, vampirish viper <laughs> who's now like attacking you at every possible moment and and then as soon as you go back into towing the line it's back to sweet mummy again you know oh i've loved you all the way along even when i was angry with you i was fine you know? and that's the way it goes you come down yeah i'm wondering if there's uh, where does the law of attraction come into all this um, i'm thinking is there such a thing as a global uh, law of attraction that we have women be suppressed by men? Of course. Or, oh. Of course there's a global law of attraction. Yeah. But what I'm finding a lot for people on the divine love path is we are justifying the law of attraction as a method to continue treating other people badly. And this is not on from God's perspective. Do you, do you follow me? Like, for example, let, let me just... Do, so he, here's this man that I had in my life in the past and here I am as the woman, right? And this man verbally abused me and he sometimes hit me. He hit me and he verbally abused me, verbal abuse, right? And I've, and I've had the him, him to put up with in my life. Now, that's also a law of attraction, isn't it, at play? But does that, but does that justify his unloving behaviour? Does my law of attraction justify his unloving behaviour? No, right? Just because it's my law of attraction, it's not a justification for unloving behaviour. Unloving behaviour is unloving behaviour. No matter whether you attracted it through some soul condition of your own or not, it's still unloving behaviour. Does that make sense? Now, I can say as the woman, I can say, well, now I'm going to feel like I need to protect myself from men. Right? That's the result of this man's abuse. Right? I'm going to look for safety and security. I'm not going to be vulnerable to a man. I'm going to be closed towards the man. I'm going to be, you know, all these different things, right, that I could list here as the result of this man's verbal and physical abuse of me. Is all of that justification for you to shut down your relationship with God in the end? No. All right? And so what we've got to do is we've got to say, all right, now all of this stuff has entered me. Sure, there was a law of attraction. This man was unloving. All right? He was unloving. And there's no doubts about it. I'm not saying he wasn't. He was very unloving. And in fact, all of God's laws will go to correct his unloving behaviour at some point in his life, whether it be now, and usually it's a mixture of now and in the spirit world. He will be corrected for his unloving behaviour. But that doesn't justify now my unloving addictions. You see? It doesn't justify my unliving addictions. Now let's reverse that. Let's now reverse that. And we've got now this man who's a placating man who placates the feminine. He wants to look after the feminine, make her safe, make her secure. And every time he gets out of line, she is angry with him and she is abusive towards him. And she talks about him to all of her friends and so forth and so forth. Right? Who's the one being unloving now? She is. So she's got all this unloving behaviour. Now, is that his law of attraction? Yes, but does that justify her unloving behaviour? No. You see, we've got to stop justifying our own unloving behaviour. 
when I'm in a rage, am I loving? No. Stop justifying your rage then. Like, what's the point of justifying your unloving behaviour? All you're doing is saying to God, like, F you, God, I'm going to do what I want. Basically, that's what you're saying. You're saying that you're going to stay in a state of anger, rage and resistance and you're going to stay in that state for as long as you want, which is fine, you're allowed to. God says you're allowed to. You're allowed to stay this place. And, but do you think you're ever going to be at one with God staying in this place? No. Of course not. How can you be at one with God when you're not at one with one of his creations? Which happens to be your husband or your wife or your daughter or your mother or your father. How can you be? Do you have a mic? Can Just if you keep your hand up. Um, hi. I, I do the justification thing really well. Of? Of anything, of if I've done it to someone or someone's done it to me, like I find it easy to, like I feel the anger and then I can get to the compassion of the story behind what's happening. Yep. And then I, I find it so hard sometimes to get to the grief because the story that I was told of Jesus, it, it gets me, it gets in my way. And I, I don't, I want you to help me with this yeah, because... Yeah. I, I, I see how, and I even remember the whole vision of when I was little and I'd see a movie of Jesus and stuff, and Jesus would be going to the cross and people would be hurting him mm -hmm. and I would feel upset when I would see that. But mm -hmm. then Jesus would say, it's okay, they don't know what they are doing, you know, mm -hmm. and he would love them. Mm -hmm. And because well, I've been wanting to be like Jesus since I was little, I, that's what I do. I love them any, and, I, and I justify things that happen because of that. This is the uh, problem, is that we face the difference between what I want and what I am. You see, um, the only way I became what you imagine to be perfect with regard to the interactions with people is by releasing what I am. But you see, when we go, oh, what I want to be is this perfect person, and so what I'm going to do now is avoid my emotions of what I am, I will never become the perfect person I want to be. The only way to become the perfect person you want to be is to never avoid the emotions of what you are right now. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so never make the choice, in other words, never make the choice to actually ignore the emotion that's present right in this moment. So, so a situation occurs. The story happens. Right? And all of a sudden I'm feeling an emotion. Let's say the emotion is of anger. I'm feeling angry. I can tell myself the story that I shouldn't be angry and get out of this anger. Or I can start feeling the anger and get into the grief that's under the anger and release it completely. If I tell myself the story, which is saying, I want to be something different and that's what I'm going to make myself. When I tell myself that story, what I'm actually doing is forcing myself away from my true emotional condition. And as I force myself away from my true emotional condition, I will not release the underlying causal emotion. And so what I'm doing is creating this, this strange condition where actually I'll never, I'll be angry every time that event occurs. Every time the same thing happens, I get the same response. Same thing, same response, same thing, same response. And I'm doing that because I'm never allowing my response to go fully into its grief and released. Does that make sense? And what we often finish up doing in that space is we tell ourselves messages like, it's not spiritual to feel angry. Right? And I agree totally. That is the truth. It's not spiritual to feel angry in the sense that when you are completely at one with God, you will never feel angry again. That's true. However, the truth is in this particular moment, I am angry. And I need to recognise the truth of the moment. I am angry. So therefore, that tells me I am not at one with God yet. And do I want to be? Yes, I do. But how am I going to be? By feeling the fears and the grief that is underlying this anger and releasing it way. And I'm starting to lose my battery, so I'll just change that. And while I do, can somebody just tell me what the time is? It's 
So, AJ, so when I'm feeling angry yep. and I see, like, in a way, what pops up is the bigger picture. Like, I can see where stop, the pain's coming. Stop seeing the bigger picture. Yeah, so that's what you're yeah. saying. Because that's yeah. where the justification comes in. Exactly. Is, so, it, that's just a habit. Yeah, that's a habit, and it's a great habit to get out of emotion. It's a great tool that we've used all of our lives to get out of emotion. What we do is we tell ourselves, oh, but mum was only feeling this, or dad was only feeling that, or yeah, my husband, he didn't really mean what he... He just had a bad day at work, and you know what I mean? And we go down yeah. that line, but, but what we need to do instead is release cause of it, and the cause of it is our own soul condition's law of attraction. And if we can underline, go deeper into the cause of it inside ourselves and release that, the event will not occur again, or if it does occur again, it won't affect us. In the, in, we won't yeah. have an anger response. Yeah, the event does reoccur, and I do feel the same. And I have this illusion then of because I see and justify, it's easy for me, for me to forgive. And then I think I've forgiven, but I've only forgiven in my head, haven't exactly. I? Exactly. True okay. forgiveness is in the heart, and it, true forgiveness results in the event never occurring again, generally. So, that, so if I'm having a constant law of attraction, same thing happening, same thing happening. So for example, I have men coming up to me, treating me the same way every time. Well, that's telling me that you can forgive all you like here, but there's something in here that's attracting the event, which means you haven't forgiven here. Yeah, but I, th I think I've forgiven in my heart, but I obviously haven't. So that's where I've become aware of now. Yeah, okay. so the key is that, all right, this is an emotion inside of myself that's attracting these events, and I need to release that emotion. I need to go into the grief in the end, because most of it's grief or shame or guilt and all those other deeper emotions um, that we need to allow ourselves to experience. And when we experience those, our law of attraction will change. And our law of attraction is beautiful because it tells us that we have yet to change. You see? So most of us finish up going around avoiding our law of attraction. It's a bit like, you know, an obstacle course. You know, like, so there's an obstacle there, an obstacle there, an obstacle there, and we just go avoid that one and avoid that one and avoid that one by avoiding the persons who usually trigger us a lot too. You know, this is how, what we do. Like, we've got a bad relationship with our mother, so what do we finish up doing? We avoid her most of the time. And that's a way of actually avoiding my law of attraction. I'd be better off confronting my mother with the issues and confronting each issue emotionally inside of myself. And as I did that, what will happen? is I'll heal that and ironically I'll have probably either a better relationship with mother, my mother or my mother will leave my life voluntarily. <laughs> One of the two will happen. And so when we start doing the emotional obstacle course, you know, and we start ducking and weaving out of our law of attraction, what we're actually doing is not owning the fact that we are creating our life through our law of attraction. So what is happening in my life right now is the result of my law of attraction. All of you are my law of attraction. The fact that I'm having this conversation with you actually is about my law of attraction. Because you know what my law of attraction has been with women? I have placated angry women all my life. And today I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> And one way to stop is to have a room full of women who are quite upset with men and to tell them the truth about what's been going on. And that's one way of confronting the situation for myself. Does that make sense? And in my personal life with Mary, it's exactly the same as that. We're having to confront these issues of what's going on between each other in terms of my placating the, uh, an angry woman. And Mary, because of her humility, is getting into the grief associated with her controls, right? And that's the beauty of doing this. And that's the beauty, you guys, of no longer responding with anger in kind and no longer getting violent with the woman because of her attempts to control you, but rather being honest and not buying off this stuff anymore is a powerful thing that will help your ladies get through this emotion too, right? So in other words, every time you support your wife or your partner being angry, right, you are actually helping her stay away from God. That's what you're doing. And by the way, if she supports you being angry, she's doing exactly the same. It's helping you stay away from God. And, and what I'd like to do after the break is we'll talk more about 
anger and what's the underlying reason for it. Right? But, but what I wanted to do is talk more about this as well after break because it's the emotions that we have towards the, the, the mother that we often avoid the most. Right? And in the process of avoiding these emotions, we create so many problems on this planet ourselves. And I want to, uh, after the break, show you some realisations that I've had through the week about different things, just some memory things I've been uh, remembered, and talk to you about those things too, because they have an effect on this discussion. So, so can you see how, if we start looking at the mother in a true and accurate picture, we can see that actually the majority of our emotions that we have to heal will relate to mother. And therefore, if we're female, the majority of our emotions that we have to heal relate to ourselves. And if we're male, the majority of the emotions we have to heal, and I'm talking about this law of attraction in this audience, not every male, by the way, if we're male in this audience, we've got to look at how much we're prepared to placate the woman in the process. And that's been our pattern up until this point. Now, AJ's law of attraction is changing, which means that in future, males might be in a different place. So, so um, one thing I've noticed a lot too happening as a result of this is many of you are setting up little helper groups, you know, where you want to help people you're setting up groups where you're meeting together once a week or whatever and helping each other deal with emotions. Have you noticed the gender that is there? How many men are there present with you ladies? None in most cases. Why do you reckon that is? Can you see that any man in his right mind is not going to come? <laughs> You only attract someone like me along. <laughs> right? because, because a man who, who actually has a sense of himself and a sense of uh, you know, loving himself won't be attracted to that environment. Does that make sense? So look at your law of attraction. One of the first things I would discuss if I was a group of people meeting together is I would look at the dominant gender in that group and I'd say, right, we've got to focus on ourselves first because there's a heap of blocks we've got towards this opposite gender right at this moment. So, so you notice the separation of the genders occurring all the time on this planet, don't you? All the time. You know, go out for the hen's night and the buck's party. and the, yeah, all separa It's all separation. Do we want to have that or do we want to have something ch different change on the planet? Like what I would like to see on the planet is no gender separation. Right? In other words, we each treat each other in a loving manner all the time and we don't want to separate the opposite gender from anything we do. So you know, you ladies, when you go and get your manicure and your pedicure, men are all invited. <laughs> if they want to come, of course. <laughs> and you guys, when you go out and play footy on the footy field, all the women are invited. Right? Now, of course, there's a lot of emotions there, isn't there? Like, see, a lot of the men are all just competing with the men, so they don't want, want women there. And a lot of the women are just like, you know, they, they are angry with the men, so they don't want men there. Right? See, a lot of times, if you look at even what's going on in terms of literature on the planet, you can see all of these intergender separation occurring, can't you? How many women's magazines are there? Yeah. You go in a aisle of the news agent and the entire aisle what kind of women's magazines are they lots, lots of gossip so that's a woman's attraction law of attraction fashion which is understandable like it's creative so that's a good thing beauty which is about women's law of attraction about feeling ugly right they're called ugly magazines aren't they like yeah and there's a song there's a song that goes like that isn't there i forget what it's called now but anyway and and, and you look at what are men's uh, magazines. Sex and... Car yeah, 
Sport. Sex and sport, basically, isn't it? Sex and sport. So, so we can see in that the actual emotional issue in both genders. You see, why do men choose sport? Mostly it's to compete with other men. What would they compete with other men for? So they can feel good about themselves. And who makes them feel good about themselves? Ah, the women, you see. The women do, you see. You see, if I can show off to my woman and show oh, I'm a more prowess, I've got... See, so what's a woman looking for? She's looking for a nice, strong man, right? Strong man. Because what she got, she's got no safety. She's got no safety. She needs security, does she not? So she needs a nice, strong man, someone who's going to demonstrate his, she's, he's going to fight for her. Come, Yeah, many of you ladies have this emotion where you want the man to fight for you. And if he doesn't fight for you, you would spit the dummy, right? Like, honestly, you'd even break your relationship sometimes if he doesn't fight for you. Like, can you see where this comes from? You want a man to protect you. Is that love? No. What if your man's like this short? He's your soulmate. And he's your soulmate. And you're this tall. And, like, and then there's this big giant man come along who wants to rape you. I'm serious now. He wants to rape you. Is this man going to be able to protect you? No. And you've got to ask yourself, what, why was this man wanting to rape me in the first place? Now, there's, there's got to be some emotions I'm not dealing with here too, right? That's attracting, why have I not been able to just seen this event right from the beginning and not even be around it? Right? So there's issues there that we need to face. So I'm not saying, remember, that the person who's unloving isn't being unloving. What I'm saying is that this person who's attracted this does have a law of attraction to also work their way through. And what we need to do as, as any party in any situation is we need to look seriously at our law of attraction of what's really going on. And we need to allow ourselves to deal with the emotions inside of me. So if I'm a woman and I feel unsafe and insecure, the answer isn't to get a big strong man to make me feel safe and secure. Right? That's not the answer. The answer is to release the unsafe and insecure emotion from me. And then I'll know that God is with me at all moments and I'll be told in advance what is going to happen and I'll be able to avoid all sorts of situations as a result just from me being in this different space where I'm connected with God now because my unsafe, insecure addiction don't, no, has been dealt with and no longer draws me to a male who can protect me. Ironically, it will then draw me to the male who is my other half, which may not be the exact thing that you thought in the first place. Right? Is this, uh, you know, like I've said in the past, there are murderers and there are rapists and they, many of them are in jail and some of them are your soulmates. Does that make sense? They've got to be somebody's soulmate, don't they? Right. So, so what we need to do is work our way through the issues where we can actually, actually address these issues into gen, into gender issues and actually attract this soulmate, even if he's in that condition. That's what we want to do. You just have a, just just leave your hand up. Thanks. Given that we're the other half of that person, mm -hmm. how much have we, as the other half, created that circumstance in them? Um, we've got to be careful about getting too metaphysical with all of this. Because, um, but there is a truth in that any emotion that's inside of me does actually create your life. And what I want to do after the break is tell you how that occurs. All right? So um, there is an emotion, we, one of the things that we often feel is this really, really deep desire to hold on to our own free will. In other words, what we do is we justify to ourselves doing whatever we want, whenever we want, with whoever we want, right? being completely self-sufficient and self-reliant. And we justify to ourselves our own free will without knowing, actually, 
what's being created by ourselves at that moment. And the truth is that everything you ever hear of and everything you ever see and everything that ever happens, not only in your life but in the lives of the people you are surrounded by, is actually your partly creation. Right? So that means if I driving down the road and I turn on the radio, and right at that time I'm hearing about a woman in Africa who's been abused by men and who has had her uh, vagina sewn up uh, in what is it called female circumcision and I'm driving along. In that particular moment, whoever I am, male or female, there's a law of attraction and I'm a part of the event. I, there's an emotion inside of me that was a part of creating that event. Well, just because it's part of your law of attraction. As soon as it's part of your law of attraction, there's an emotion inside of yourself that helped create the event. This is something we all need to understand. And what I'll do after the break is talk to you about that and, uh, and we'll, we'll sort of relate that to our lives and our law of attraction. So let's have a break. So